My first question to you guys is, how many of you think of yourselves as lucky people? Raise your hand if you think you're lucky. Raise your hand if you think you're unlucky. There are a few of you out there. I see someone very enthusiastic in the back, being like, me, 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 I'm really unlucky. <laughs> All right, sir, we'll talk about you later. <laughs> um, and how many of you don't want to raise your hand because you don't think you're either lucky or unlucky? Most of you see your skeptics. <laughs> so first, I think in order to answer that question, we need to answer another question, which is, what is luck, right? And there are lots of answers to this question. One answer, and this is an answer you get very frequently in the United States, um, is, you know, luck is things like preparation meeting opportunity. And to that I say, no, that's preparation and opportunity. That's not actually luck. Um, so that's not the kind of luck I'm talking about. Or they say, you know, luck is lucky breaks in your career, lucky things, you know, you make your own luck. And I say, no, that's a, that's a good break, you are a good professional networker, you have friends who like you, lots of people know you, again, that's not luck. So when I think of luck, and we're in Las Vegas, so what better place to talk about luck in this particular way, I'm thinking of total randomness, chance, noise, the stuff in the universe and in your lives that you don't want to deal with because we can't explain it and it just happens. So the spin of a roulette, of a roulette wheel, you have absolutely zero control over it. And so that's total chance. Happening to be in a city the moment an earthquake hits, once again, total chance. So that is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about luck. And that is the kind of luck that I'm going to be talking about today. So, this stuff, this noise of the universe. And in some sense, you know, we're all very, very lucky because we're all alive. And that's pretty great. Because out of all the potential people who could have been born, you're born, and you're here, and you're listening to this talk, and that's pretty awesome. So I think I'm a very lucky person just by virtue of standing here. But most people don't really like that answer. And so instead, you get into these extremes of trying to explain randomness rather than just accept that there's randomness in life. So you have one extreme. And that extreme is things like religion. So you start saying fate, right? It's not just that stuff happens. It's that someone makes stuff happen. There's a big plan for all of us. There's a meaning in everything. Fate, kind of, you have the extreme of this in religions like Calvinism, which is predetermination, right? Everyone has a fate when they're born, and you live out that fate. Now, on the other extreme, you have the people who say, actually, luck doesn't exist at all. You make your own luck. And we actually live in a country that brings that to an extreme. It's called the American dream. It's that everyone can be anything they want. It's at its, at its extreme, and I love that we actually just saw some firewalkers because the extreme of this type of thinking is books like The Secret, right? If you can think about it enough, if you can just picture it, it is going to happen. That is the power of the human mind. If I can just picture myself going over all of those coals, my feet are not going to burn. Isn't that awesome? And by the way, the guru who's talked about in, in The Secret is currently... Um, in jail for criminal charges because some of his followers died. So that's just an aside, but I'm pretty happy about that. Not, not that I know him personally, but, but sometimes good things happen. But you also have less extreme versions of this on things that people actually accept on a daily basis. So Oprah Winfrey, right, someone who is on television, someone who people see as an icon, she gave an interview once where she said she does not believe in luck. She said, and I quote, nothing about my life is lucky. End quote. That's it. And I just wanted to say, excuse me, um, can I just interject here? Do you realize how lucky you've been? I mean, you were born here, right? You weren't born a woman in Saudi Arabia. You were born in a place that gave you all of these opportunities. And sure, you've made your own way and you have had some you know, great skill along the way, 
but you can't just say, I don't believe in luck. And then she went on to say, luck should be a word that doesn't exist in the English language. If I could pick one word to excise, it would be luck. And once again, I thought, well, that's a really bad way of looking at the world because then what are you going to do when luck happens? And so instead, a lot of people aren't at either of those extremes. I'm assuming that nobody here believes in the secret. I'm really sorry if you do. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm breaking your heart here. Um, and I'm assuming there aren't any Calvinists in the audience. Um, and once again, I apologize. You know, I'm, I'm equal opportunity. Calvinists, welcome. But as long as you're not at one of those extremes, most people don't just say, you know, oh, this just happened, there was a 0.03% probability of it happening, so I guess it happened. We don't really think that way. And so instead, we try to kind of come up with ways that things might happen, we try to come up with stories. So even the most skeptical and rational of us probably has had a moment where we've had an uncanny coincidence or something happened and we find ourselves saying, what are the chances that, you know, that, that this happened? Or telling a story you know, about meeting your loved one or meeting someone who became a boss and saying, if that bus hadn't been 20 minutes late and if I hadn't done that, then we never would have met and then you hold hands and look at each other, and everyone's really happy, and you think that, you know, oh, this is such a sweet story if all of this stuff didn't happen, but it did. Talk about the universe and talk about coincidence. So that's one of those things that we actually do all the time without really realizing that most of it isn't really anything. It's just pure random coincidence. Um, and People do this all the time, especially when there's something bad, when there's a disaster. But right? you have all of these stories after 9-11 happened, when people said, you know, I'm always in the office on time, 9 a.m. on the dot, but this morning, you know, I was late because I had misplaced my ticket and blah, blah, blah. It was, you know, the universe telling me something, and so I came late to work, and I survived. Well, that's called selective amnesia because you actually do this all the time, and this person does not arrive in the office at 9 a.m. every single morning. You just forget all of those times that your office was not destroyed, that that happened. So instead, our memory is totally selective, and we focus on that one time as a coincidence. Now, um, as, as you guys now know, I'm playing poker, and you would not be, you would just be absolutely blown away how many people say, you know, I knew that that ace was coming. There are so many psychics in poker, it's not even funny. I mean, these people should really be betting on the lottery because they always know. They're like, I know that was happening. And it's this uncanny feeling when it does happen, you're like, yep. And then all those 999 other times you knew it was coming and it didn't come, you just lost. And so you don't remember those. Um, my grandfather, whom I love dearly, had a story like this where, so he, this was in the Soviet Union, in St. Petersburg, and every single day after work, he would take the metro home. There was this big, ornate escalator down to the metro um, that he would take with his colleagues. On this particular day, he went to the metro, and then, for some reason, it was a pretty day, he decided he was gonna walk home, something he, quote unquote, never did. Um, and actually, what ended up happening was the escalator tour. It was one of the biggest, kind of, accidents in the Soviet Union at the time, a lot of his colleagues died because they were on that escalator. And so this is kind of my family lore of luck and of kind of these uncanny premonitions. Actually, that's not true. My grandfather was a walker, and so he probably walked and decided to walk many times and just focused on this one, and it went down into my family history as, oh my God, this is coincidence, this is chance. And it's really, really difficult to get away from that kind of thinking. And instead, what we can do and what people have tried to do is say, okay, you know, I realize that chance exists and that my mind is going to try to create these causal stories. Um, let me tell you about the time I met my husband. No, <laughs> I'm not going to. But I could actually get you one of those fate stories if I really wanted to. But your mind is going to do that anyway, so why don't we create a useful framework that tries to get around that? So since we're in Las Vegas, I'm gonna tell you a story about a casino. But a casino at another time, 
back in the 1930s and not in Las Vegas in Monte Carlo. So instead of hoodies and kind of torn jeans and t-shirts, picture suits and jackets and James Bond. Kind of that, that kind of vibe. And there's a man named Johnny. And he walks into one of these casinos and sits down at a roulette table and starts playing roulette. He's playing along, and all of a sudden, a really attractive woman comes up to him and asks him what he's doing. Because this man doesn't look like the other roulette players. They're all just playing, and he has all of these papers with him, and the papers have some weird mathematical things on them. And so this woman was really intrigued. She's saying, what are you doing playing roulette? And he said, you know, um, hi, nice to meet you. I'm actually developing a, a system to beat roulette. So I am developing a foolproof system. I am going to beat this game. And she says, oh, ha, 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 very funny, and goes to drink because her husband is playing as well, but she's a pretty smart woman, so she realizes you can't beat roulette, so she's going to be at the bar. A little while later, she's sitting at the bar, and this man, Johnny, comes up to her and asks her if it's okay if he takes a seat next to her. And she says, yes, of course. You know, I hate to be a lonely drinker. To which he responds, oh, drink. That would be really, really nice. But can you afford to buy me one? Because it ends up his system wasn't quite as foolproof as he thought it was, and he was now completely broke. But he does sit down, and she does buy him a drink, and she becomes, she ends up divorcing her husband and becomes Clary von Neumann, and John von Neumann ends up inventing game theory um, out of the scribbles that he was inventing that night in the casino in Monte Carlo. Chance, fate, what a story, right? <laughs> um, but it ends up, John von Neumann realizes, okay, you know, I couldn't beat roulette. I'm actually going to focus on poker. This was my inspiration, von Neumann. See, now poker becomes a much more noble profession, right? Because I got it from John von Neumann. <laughs> you know, so I'm just following in the footsteps of one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. Um, so he decided that he was going to solve poker, and this was actually the inspiration for game theory. Because poker, to him, was the perfect game to try to mimic chance and skill in life. Because in poker, there's a huge amount of skill, right? Over the long term, the skilled players are going to win. There's strategy, there's how you play. We're not going to go into a poker lesson, but skill is really, really important. And yet, there are cards, it's a deck, and you cannot control the cards. So the most skilled player at any one game can lose. You could have never played poker before, sit down, heads up with the greatest player in the world, who's me, of course, um, and win. Because the cards just went your way, and no matter how skilled I am, they went against me. That happens. And in poker, like in life, there's, so there's this uncertain element because you don't know anyone else's cards. You only know your own cards. So there's incomplete information. So von Neumann actually went through a bunch of games before he focused on poker. He played chess, but he decided actually chess is really, really bad if you, want, if you want a theory that's going to mimic life, because it's a game where there's always a right answer. There's no uncertainty. There's no incomplete information. There's theoretically always a correct move. And that move can be solved. And indeed, AI has solved chess right now, and computers can win against humans. And what von Neumann was after was the human element, not that. So he even took bridge aside, because in bridge, the element of chance was not the same, and life is a solitary game, not a game where you're playing on a team. And so he decided that if he could solve poker, he could actually solve the most complex strategic decisions in the world. And so he used this as an analogy when he was trying to advise the National Security Council in the United States during World War II. And it's not a, co a coincidence that a lot of our presidents actually were poker players. Um, Truman made a lot of money during World War II going back and forth on his ship and playing poker with the war correspondents. Um, and this was also his way, he really disagreed with the Secretary of State, so this was his way of it of avoiding him, he'd play poker instead. Um, and he made a lot of his decisions that way. And what von Neumann's approach does is actually say, okay, you know, th there's chance, and you're never going to be able to change the cards or change the fact that you don't know them. Let's give us a framework to think through it. 
a game theoretical framework where you can try to anticipate and try to figure out how do I respond to bluffs? How do I respond to this? How do I respond to that? And where our minds, our feeble little minds that are so bad at figuring out probabilities, have a chance to figure out the errors in our thinking. And poker, no limit hold'em, has actually still not been solved. So John von Neumann's challenge still exists. Artificial intelligence has not been able to solve the game. And in the process, though, we've learned a lot about the human mind and a lot about how we can think about luck in ways that are actually more productive because it really points out what we do wrong. So one of these things, I have kind of three, three main lessons that I've learned um, from my last year as a professional poker player. Um, the first of these has to do with the illusion of control. And that's the feeling that you have that you're still in control of events when you're actually not. So for instance, you know, stock market operators who, act, who think that they are, are totally in control of whether stocks are going up or down when they're actually not. But they think that they are still kind of, that it's all skill. They disregard chance. The original study of the illusion of control, one of my favorite experiments in psychology, happened in the 1970s at Harvard University, where Ellen Langer decided to have people flip a coin. Now, we can all agree that flipping a coin and guessing whether it's heads or tails is totally a game of skill, right? Yeah? I, I'm, I happen to be very good at predicting coin flips. That's, that's kind of one of my hidden talents. So, um, in this experiment, she had another student flip the coin, and what you had to do was say heads or tails. And if you were right, she would say right, and if you were wrong, she would say wrong. Um, and this study was totally rigged, because in each case, there would be, you'd be half right, half wrong, but what she altered was the order in which you were right or wrong. So sometimes you'd be right a lot right at the beginning, sometimes it would seem kind of random, and sometimes you'd be right along toward the end. And what ended up happening was these Harvard students, when they were right a lot at the beginning, something really weird happened to their minds. When she then asked them questions like, please answer, I am good at predicting heads or tails. They would say, yes, I'm very skilled at it. I'm going to get better with practice. Yes, I need more time. If I have more time, I'm actually going to be even better. Um, and total, total questions that actually get at skill, they thought that this was skill, that this was a skill that they had, and that they were getting much better at it. And I actually, for my dissertation, ended up replicating this study with stock market people. <laughs> um, so we, we ended up doing the same thing and realizing that people all over the world still fall prey to this exact paradigm and start believing in the illusion of control, that they're in control of things like coin flipping, and then that it affects their subsequent behavior. They end up learning much worse from their environment. So in the study that we ran um, with Walter Michel was basically having people pick stocks where there was a very clear good stock and bad stock, and they were supposed to be learning from the environment people who were kind of high in this illusion of control ended up not learning. They would continue the same strategy that had been working for them before, and they wouldn't take the negative feedback when we changed it on them, because they would think that they were still in control. Whereas people who were kind of a little bit more tentative about it saw it right away and actually ended up making more money because they saw that they were making the wrong decisions, and they learned. So the illusion of control can actually be really bad because it leads us to be too confident in our, own, in our own skill and to disregard the environment when chance is actually happening. Believe me, there's no better place than the poker table to disabuse you of the illusion of control. Um, the worst players are the ones who say, you know, I've got this, let me, let me just play a few more hands and, and then we're good, and who don't actually adjust their strategy, which leads me to the second thing I've learned, which is, of course, we have to talk about this, the gambler's fallacy, or as Daniel Kahneman called it, the law of small numbers, which is that our mind is really, really bad at figuring out that numbers over the short term aren't representative of numbers overall. And when, the, when you're talking about probabilities, you're talking about 
thousands and thousands and thousands of occasions as opposed to 10 or 20 or even 100. And so people, when they start seeing a run of things, start thinking things like Richard Weissman's worst advice, red is due. Always, always bet on red, right? Because if, if the roulette wheel has been coming up, green, 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 right? It's green, green and red, right? <laughs> black, <laughs> what's, the, what's the number? If it's been coming up black, 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 then red must be due. Because we can't wrap our mind around the fact that runs are going to happen um, and that that's totally natural. Um, back in 1951, there was a wonderful study by Murray Jarvik, um, and he said that he was studying ESP which we all know is true, um, and we all know exists, so why study it? But he decided to waste his time and study extrasensory perception, except that's not actually what he was studying. But here's what the study went like. You had a bunch of students ha having to guess check or plus, and every four seconds, he would say check or plus, but a second before, he would say now, and you'd actually have to draw either a check or a plus um, and then you'd see if you get it right, if your prediction was accurate. You know, so if, you're, if you have good ESP, you should get all of these right. If you're bad at ESP, you're not going to get as many right. And so every single study had more checks than pluses. Some had 60% checks, 67, up to 75%. And so you'd expect that people would, set, would kind of over time learn this and start guessing check much more often. And that really did happen a few times, except when suddenly he would do something really tricky and do a lot of checks in a row. After two, people started guessing plus more. After three, they got really uncomfortable. After four, they started guessing plus, even if they were always wrong. They just couldn't deal with the fact that you had these runs of numbers. Um, and so we always think our luck is going to change. Um, the gambler's fallacy is a fallacy. Um, your luck is not going to change. If you are, you know, there's no such thing as my luck is due. And this is one of the biggest fallacies that we make when it comes to luck and when it comes to your reaction. So to use the poker metaphor, if you're losing money, get up from the table and leave. Because probably it's not all luck. And don't think that your luck is actually due to change because chance is random. It really doesn't care what happened last time around at all. It just cares about what's going to happen next. But here's a really funny caveat to that. We, are, we really think that you know, red is due if black's been coming up, but if the run is good, it's not going to change. It's actually going to stay exactly the same, which leads us to the third thing, the hot hand fallacy, which um, Gilovich and Amos Tversky, who was Kahneman's collaborator, discovered back when they decided to look at the records of sports teams. And you have this notion in sports of the hot hand. You know, he has the hot hand, we're going to pass to him. You have it in stock markets, he's hot, he has good stock picking ability. People get hot, they go on streaks, and you want to trust them. Now, fallacy, because when they analyzed the records of the 76ers and the Celtics, they found out that there was actually no such thing, and that there wasn't a hot hand, and that people didn't suddenly start getting better because they were on a streak. Except there's a caveat to this, which is in the last five years, people have found that the hot hand fallacy, in some cases, is not a fallacy. In some sports, going on streaks and believing that you have a hot hand actually makes your performance better. And if you, and to me, that was totally crazy, because when I was in grad school for psychology, we knew that the hot hand fallacy was an absolute fallacy. But then you take a step back and you realize, actually, a lot of sports are about psychology and attitude. And if you think you're hot, you're going to be more confident. You might actually perform better in high-pressure situations. You might actually start getting better. Sometimes, not all sports, not always. And it's very easy, so we need to draw a fine line between confidence and overconfidence, so it's very easy to think of luck as your own skill. I'm so damn good. Um, and then that's not good because we'll go back to the illusion of control where you think that it's all you and it's really not. But this is actually one of the most kind of inspiring things in a way. And you can see it play out in poker all the time. If someone is doing well, it becomes really hard to play against them because they become very confident. And when they're confident, 
you actually kind of let them have it. You think, <laughs> okay, you know, maybe they really know what they're doing. And so, in a way, I think if we use the hot hand fallacy, this could be a way that we can make chance work in our favor. So I kind of see it as a luck amplifier effect. As long as we recognize that it's pure chance, we can then use it to make our attitude better and to actually try to capitalize on it. And on the other hand, when we're kind of in the gambler's fallacy, realize that that's really wrong, and so use that as kind of a luck dampener. Just step away and actually minimize your downside, minimize your losses. And so, at the end of the day, I think what I come away with is that, and this is the best advice I ever got, as you know, shit happens. And sometimes it's really good shit. And when good shit happens, we should take it, embrace it, and try to use the confidence it gives us to then amplify our skill and kind of use that run to do things that are actually skill-based. And when bad shit happens, we should acknowledge that you know, there is chance and that this is a big element in life and it has, you know, sometimes it has to do with us, other times it doesn't, and we just need to make the most of it and move away. Um, because ultimately, we can't control it, we can never control what cards are actually dealt, but we can control how we play them. And hopefully, thinking about luck in this more rational way will make us better players at life. And I think that that's actually pretty damn lucky. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>